Armando Hasurigan, Biology and Medicine videos. Please make sure to subscribe, join the forum and group for the latest videos. Please visit Facebook Armando Hasurigan. Please like, and here you can also ask questions, answer questions, and post some interesting things, including artworks. And you can also change the quality settings to the highest one for better graphics. In this video, we're going to look at the overview of microbiology. Microbiology studies microorganisms such as bacteria, for example. Now, microorganisms are actually present everywhere, literally even under our foot and on our hair, for example. However, very few actually cause any form of diseases, so it's okay. And now due to the development of magnifying instruments uh, within the century, for example, enabled scientists to learn much more uh, about these microorganisms. And these magnifying instruments, for example, uh, there are three main ones. These are, these are known as the compound light microscope, the transmission electron microscope, and the scanning electron microscope. What are the difference? Well, the compound light microscope is really just the basic. And we are able to see microorganisms through a series of lenses. And they can actually magnify about one, a typical one, about 1,000 to 2,000 times uh, magnification. And we usually use a glass side to view these microorganisms. Now, an important concept to know about microscopes is what's known as resolution. And because microorganisms are very, very, very small, Micro resolution is important for microscopes in order to um, separate between two microorganisms, essentially to view fine detail of these microorganisms. Now the next type of microscope is a transition electron microscope, and these have much better resolution, magnification you can say, than the compound light microscope. Um, so we can see better detail um, of these microorganisms. So why can we see these microorganisms in better detail? because the transmission electron microscope uses electrons, not light waves, and electron waves are much more smaller, and so we can see better detail. And typically, a transmission electron microscope can magnify up to 100,000 times magnification. And we usually view these, um, the image on a photographic plate over here. However, uh, the bad thing about this transmission electron microscope is that we cannot actually uh, use living cells whereas a compound light microscope we could. And the final one is a scanning electron microscope and this is probably the coolest microscope ever because it, it, it enables us, it enables um, scientists to view these microorganisms in 3D and so and it only can um, uh, magnify up to 10,000 however the, 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 the detail of these microorganisms in 3 dimension is awesome. So now let's look at some few methods of preparation. Uh, we're concentrating on the compound light microscope typically. And um, the main type of uh, preparation method, there are a few, but the main one is that we can suspend the microorganisms in a droplet of water. And so we can view it in a living state, for example, the movement. Um, and we can also use a dye because usually microorganisms are actually colorless. And after we dye it, or we, 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 um, we place it in water, we can then observe this microorganism using a microscope. Now this dyeing technique, uh, which is to color a microorganism, is actually really important in classifying bacteria into two major groups. And the technique we use for dyeing is called the Gram stain technique, when we use a particular uh, dye, which colors the bacteria in different colors depending on the cell wall composition. And so, for example, if the, the bacteria will be classified as gram-positive if the color turns purple. However, if, if the bacteria um, turns red or pink, it will be called gram-negative bacteria. So gram-positive is usually purple color, gram-negative is red or pink color. Now let's learn about some people which are important in the field of microbiology. The first guy is by the name of Louis Pasteur, who disapproved the theory of spontaneous generation. What is spontaneous generation? Well, it's the thought that organisms arise from essentially um, uh, non-living things, such as dust, for example. Um, and he also said that microorganisms are responsible for food spoilage. And then there are these two other people, these two other men, uh, from, different, from different countries, from different fields. One was by the name of Ignis Sim Semmelweis. And, and the other one is Joseph Liston, who was actually a surgeon or a doctor. And essentially what they said is that infections are contagious, which, is, which was 
uh, quite obvious, and that they proposed ways in preventing these contagious infections. And there's some really interesting stories behind these people. And then in the 19th century, there was a, a, a really important man by the name of Robert Koch. Koch? Koch? And he proposed a German theory of disease. So what is this theory? Well, this theory essentially says that a disease is obtained from a particular microorganism or an organism. And so there's a popular diagram to explain this situation or this, uh, this theory when, for example, a sick animal, you will obtain blood from a sick animal and then we'll isolate this, isolate this uh, sample. Um, and then we can actually, uh, after some time, we can actually observe it under a microscope, for example, and we can observe microorganisms. And so if we take the same sample that was isolated and we actually culture it instead and let the organism to grow, after it's grown, we can then inject this uh, microorganism into a susceptible host, such as a, a, a similar, similar healthy animal. After some time, this should cause the same disease as the, 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 in the initial animal. And so if we, again, obtain, if we, if we take blood out of this animal and we isolate it and then we, we culture it and we observe it under a microscope, we should see the same microorganism. And using this method, Robert Koch was able to prove that anthrax is caused by a particular organism. And this was a major breakthrough to find out that a particular microorganism or organism can cause a disease. And so this was actually a major breakthrough to find out that, a, that an organism or microorganism can actually cause a disease. Now let's look at some types of microorganisms. Let's look at three main categories, and these are bacteria, viruses, and eukaryotic organisms. The eukaryotic organisms that we're going to look at include the protists and other eukaryotes. Let's begin by quickly looking through uh, what a bacteria is. Now ba bacteria is a prokaryote and lives freely in the environment. We find it literally everywhere, including inside our body. Our bodily body actually predominantly contains bacteria. And so the bacteria is can be classified um, according to its structure and has three structures. It can be spherical bacteria, a rod-shaped bacteria, and also a spiral bacteria. And a very important thing to know is that bacteria multiply very rapidly. And so this is why if we put a smudge of our hair or whatever inside a petri dish, we can see that bacteria will, will form colonies there within the, within the next few days. And so we can say that bacteria multiply very rapidly. Now the next type of microorganism is the virus. And these include viruses such as a bacteriophage, which infects particularly a bacteria, and also an influenza virus, which is very common in humans. Bacteria cause infections in other organisms, such as a bacteriophage in bacteria and the influenza virus in humans. And now the typical structure of a virus, they essentially have an outer envelope. Uh, made up of usually glycoproteins, and then an inner protein which protects the gen genetic material, either RNA or DNA. The virus size is very, very small, uh, from about 20 nanometers to the biggest one, about 300 nanometers. And so, as I mentioned, viruses infect other organisms, and so we can say that viruses, uh, influenza virus, for example, infects the pulmonary cells within our lungs. And this is how they replicate. So viruses replicate inside a cell that they had infected. And that was all for viruses. Let's look at the, uh, the eukaryotic organisms. Now, they, can, they consist of protists and other eukaryotes. Let's concentrate on protists first. And there are two types of protist family that I'm going to talk about. One of these microorganisms are known as alga, alga. And the alga are mainly aquatic organisms. And you can see them in the sea, such as seaweed. This is a type of alga. And they actually can absorb sunlight and carry out photosynthesis. So most algae carry out photosynthesis. They absorb carbon dioxide, sunlight, water, and they produce oxygen for humans. And so because they uh, can, can perform photosynthesis, they contain what's called chlorophylls. And most alga are not actually toxic to humans because we usually eat seaweed, for example. However, the some types of alga secrete neurotoxins. And so, for example, if a fish in the sea were to eat an alga, which then the alga would secrete neurotoxins once inside the fish, this fish would, be, would become poisonous and is poisonous to humans if we consume this fish. The next type of protist is the protozoa, and these are also microorganisms, and they are actually unicellular. 
And what's fascinating about them is they actually do not contain a cell wall, but they contain some form of membrane. And also their organelles or their insides are actually visible. What differs them with the alga is that they do not contain chlorophylls and so they, so they do not perform photosynthesis. And another uh, important thing to note is that they most of them live in the water. Same with algas. And so that was it for the protists. Let's look at other types of eukaryotic microorganisms. And these include the fungi. And when we think of fungus, fungi, we think of mushrooms. And these fungi, they are unicellular or they could be also multicellular. And we find them everywhere. And fungi are actually excellent for the environment. They're very good for the environment, actually, and very good for humans in that, firstly, they provide us with food. Secondly, they provide us antibiotics for certain things and also for fermentation of alcoholic, et cetera, alcohol, et cetera. And very few cause actually uh, any pathogenic effects. However, they can produce uh, some issues and problems for humans, such as tinea, pedis, tinea all around the body, for example. The other type of eukaryote is what's called the microscopic parasites. They are called microscopic because normal parasites are quite large. And so that is why we call these microscopic parasites. And they include roundworms, tapeworms, and what's called flukes. And these types of worms, they usually target our gastrointestinal tract and may cause some problems. Now, I hope you enjoy this overview of microbiology. I hope I will put up links for each of these microorganisms to look at them into more detail, the bacteria, the viruses, the protozoa, and fungi and microscopic parasites especially. Thank you.